Good morning, church. My name's Chris. I'm one of the elders here at Gospel City Church. It is my privilege and honor to preach God's word today from this passage that we just read. Let me uh, begin by saying Happy New Year. In a few short hours, we will celebrate uh, the end of 2023, and uh, we will welcome the beginning of 2024. For many of us, 2023 was a momentous year. Uh, for some of us, 2023 was a year of suffering and obstacles and difficulty. But uh, however you may have experienced 2023, my prayer for you is that as you enter into 2024, you enter in with great expectations for all that God is going to do in and through you. We have been studying the book of Hebrews. And as we've been going through the book of Hebrews, we've had one main idea, a title that's kind of carried us through. And we've talked about uh, Jesus as being supreme over all things and our great expectations for things to come. So we do look forward to great expectations. And, and this week, as we come to this passage, we want to consider that not only is Jesus supreme, but his supremacy and our great expectation means that we have a better possession. And we look forward to that better possession. Today, as we go through this passage, there's three uh, sections that we want to spend some time looking at. And so you can look here at this outline that may help you as you, if you are so inclined to take notes to follow along what's going on in the passage. In verses 26 through 31 today, we're going to look at a frightening expectation. In verses 32 to 34, we're going to talk about a steadying enlightenment. And in verses 35 to 39, we're going to look at a rewarding confidence. So three points this morning as we consider this better possession that we've been provided with in Christ. As we prepare to hear God's word proclaimed, would you join me in prayer? Father, we do come to you this morning with expectant hearts. Father, we expect you to move in our lives. We know that you are the living God. We confessed that earlier this morning as we sang songs of worship and praise, as we read and proclaimed the Nicene Creed together. Lord, we know you are the living God, the one true living God, and we expect you to move and to work in our lives. We expect 2024 to be a year where we will see you do great and awesome things in us and through us. We also expect, Father, that you would be faithful to your promises, and in that, that we would find you to be faithful to us as individuals. Lord, as we come to your passage this morning, and we consider the better possession that you have provided for us in Christ, would you use this message, and would you use your words to strengthen our faith, to build us up, that we would continually be useful to you in your service and in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This past week, uh, Rebecca and me, we celebrated 23 years of marriage. So, yeah, congratulations. You can congratulate Rebecca. She endured 23 years with me. Uh, it has been challenging at times. It's been joyful at times. There's been... It's not challenging because of me. You know, I'm not challenging. It's just challenging times. <laughs> I think anyway. We'll see. Uh, if you were to ask me to prove my marriage to Rebecca, it would be one thing if I said, well, I have a certificate that I can pull out and show you that we were married on December 29th, 2000 at the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida. And it was signed by Reverend Bar Bob Barton and a couple of other witnesses and I could prove my marriage to you that way and say, hey, here's my marriage certificate. Many of you in this room who are married have marriage certificates. When was the last time you looked at your marriage certificate? Have you seen your marriage certificate since the day you signed it? Probably not. I don't even, know. I can't even remember. Yeah, it's just paperwork, right? No married couple proves their marriage 
by their marriage certificate. Now, it's a, it's a legal process that married couples go through to register with the appropriate government authorities and to establish a family and, and all of that for tax purposes and all these things. But, but you don't look at a married couple and expect them to prove their marriage to you because they have a marriage certificate. How is it that you know that a couple is married? Well, you know, there's different ways and, and different expressions, but typically there's love that is shared between the two, and, and you can see that demonstrated in different ways through words of affection and, and kindness to one another and serving one another and caring for one another in sickness and in health sharing in treasures and in wealth, when faced with obstacles and pressures, they press into one another, seeking comfort, seeking encouragement. You see them laughing together and enjoying the company of one another. You see things like that in a married couple and you say, ah, those people are married. That is a husband and a wife. It's not a certificate that you pull out and say, ah, here I am. We're married. I think in the Christian faith, we have many people who claim to be Christian because they have some sort of a Christian certificate. Maybe they walked an aisle at a religious church service at some point and prayed a sinner's prayer, and they look back and they say, ah, I am a Christian because many years ago I prayed a prayer. Or maybe many years ago I was baptized. Or many years ago my auntie or my uncle or my parents took me to church and they said, oh, you're a Christian. So I know I'm a Christian. And people base their identity of being a follower of Jesus on something that they did years and years ago, but they cannot demonstrate that they are following Jesus today. There's nothing in their life that would demonstrate that they love Jesus and that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. Much like a married couple that perhaps has a marriage certificate, but doesn't live together, doesn't talk to one another, doesn't support one another, doesn't, you would never look at them and say, oh, that's a married couple because they're not acting like a married couple. It is very difficult to look to someone who says, I am a Christian, but doesn't live like a Christian and say, oh, well, obviously they're a Christian because this, this, and this many years ago. We come to this passage and we come to another warning passage in the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews has given several warnings throughout his book. We call it a book, but really the book of Hebrews is a sermon itself. And time and time again, he circles around to a warning because there are those who call themselves Christian with Jewish background who are tempted to leave Christ and return to their old religious ways, other things that perhaps they deem to be easier or more familiar or more comfortable, and they don't want to continue in their walk with Jesus. And the author is providing a warning. Notice in verse 26 through 31, there is a frightening expectation for those who would desire to walk away. I appreciate the the pastor, Alistair Begg, who divides the passage up similarly uh, as I have this morning, but I think he has an even easier outline to follow when he says, look out, remember, and keep on. So as we think about this frightening expectation, hear this as a warning, caution for any German speakers, Achtung, right? Stop, watch out, be on alert. The author of Hebrews tells us in verse 26, If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment, a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. 
The warning is for willful, deliberate sin. The author is warning his readers not to continue in willful, deliberate sin. The emphasis is on the willfulness. Also, he's not talking about just any and every sin that may nullify the hope that we have in Christ, but rather he has in mind apostasy. Apostasy at its simplest, at the simplest explanation is the rejection of Christ and the Christian faith. As one author has written, one cannot receive forgiveness through the once for all offering of Jesus if that person defiantly rejects Jesus. Forgiveness only belongs to those who continue to trust in Jesus for forgiveness. So he is warning those who would turn away from Christ, who would reject Christ, who at some point in their life would say, yes, I trust Christ, but no longer do I trust him. And notice what he says. The warning is not to continue in this way because of a frightening expectation for those who would do so. There is judgment. There is a fury of fire that would consume God's adversaries. To deny Christ is to be an adversary of God. The Old Testament prophet Zephaniah writes about God's judgment and the fury of fire this way in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. He says, Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. There is a warning to all of us. These warnings are here because we need them. We need to hear them. And those of you who are here this morning who think you do not need to hear these warnings are the ones who need to hear the warnings the most. You see, there is a teaching about once saved, always saved, or the perseverance of the saints. And there is this idea that some have that if I pray a prayer, or if I get baptized, or if I raise my hand in a service to say, I will follow Jesus, that all of a sudden that means everything is safe for me. I have my fire insurance and I am safe from hell and I can live however I want to, whenever and wherever, however, it's up to me, I'm safe. But what the author of Hebrews is telling us is that it doesn't matter if you have your certificate. What gives evidence of true and genuine faith is that you continue in your faith in Christ. The true test of a genuine follower of Jesus is endurance. And we're going to see that play out in the following verses. But notice first what he tells us about the judgment for those who are adversaries of Christ. He looks back to the Old Testament, which would be familiar to his audience. He says, anyone, in verse 28, who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. What he's saying is, is that there are stipulations within the Old Covenant that if disobeyed would be met with the consequence of death, the death penalty. The death penalty. The new covenant, oh, it, would, it would take two or three witnesses, right? If two or three witnesses would say, hey, this person is denying the law, then the consequence would be death. But notice what the new covenant says. The new covenant says, how much worse punishment than death do you think there is for those 
who have trampled underfoot the Son of God, profaned the blood of the covenant, and outraged the Spirit of grace. In the Old Covenant, one could be sentenced to death based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. In the New Covenant, a greater judgment is at hand based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. You see what the witnesses are? The Son of God, His blood, and the Spirit of grace. Jesus knows who His sheep are. He is the good shepherd in John 10 who lays his life down for his sheep. The author of Hebrews has gone at great lengths to portray Jesus' blood that he shed on the cross as the blood that sets apart his people to God and saves them. In chapter 9, verse 12, we're told that Jesus' blood secures eternal redemption. In chapter 9, verse 14, we're told that Jesus' blood cleanses our conscience. In chapter 9, verses 25 to 26, we're told that Jesus' blood removes sin. In chapter 10, verse 19, we're told that it's through His blood that we are given access to God's presence. Verse 29 tells us that His blood sanctifies us sets us apart. And all the way back in chapter 8, verse 13, we're told that it is Jesus' blood that inaugurates and ratifies the new covenant between God and his people, securing the forgiveness of their sins. His blood provides us not only forgiveness, but it provides us hope. We look to it. We sang about it this morning. We trust in Him because He has demonstrated His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We read that in Romans 5, 8, didn't we? His blood. And yet there are those who would profane His blood. One author says to treat the blood of Christ as profane essentially means not to believe that the blood of Christ can effect purification for sins. Someone who says, I will seek forgiveness from God another way. I will try to find access to God through some other means than the means of the blood of Jesus. Another author writes that those who reject Jesus do not seek purification by his blood. They reject his blood as unclean, tossing it aside as one would throw a minstrel cloth into the garbage. You either embrace the blood of Christ as precious, or you look at it as though it's rubbish. There are those who discredit or deny Jesus. They profane his blood. And they outrage the Spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit, whom delivers the grace to us, who Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, that he is the one who seals salvation in our lives. He is the one who woos a believer to Christ. There are those who outrage the Spirit because they reject the work that he is doing and the salvation that he offers. And so, in the Old Covenant... Someone could be sentenced to physical death because they deny the Mosaic law. That is a terrible punishment. But the author of Hebrews tells us that an even more frightening expectation is for those who deny Christ, who profane his blood, who outrage the spirit. There is a more serious judgment for them than physical death. Be afraid of falling into God's hands of judgment. The earthly punishment of the death penalty pales in comparison to what awaits those who reject Jesus. Somebody may say, well, that's not very kind of God. Isn't God loving? Yes, he is. He is a loving God. 
So He sent His Son to deal with our sins. And those who refuse the gift that He's provided in Christ, well, the eternal punishment of His fire and fury is just and right. And it's not just, or it's not only, for people who hear the gospel and can comprehend it, but it's salvation is for people who embrace the gospel, who embrace Jesus, who embrace His blood, who embrace the Spirit. You see, it's not just sitting in church on Sunday and hearing the gospel message and saying, yeah, I I know that. We're told in the scripture that even the demons know the gospel. They know and the facts, they, they can tell you what the gospel is. Hell is full of people with a clear understanding of the gospel. People who have heard the gospel and can tell you what it is, but it's never gone the 18 inches from head to heart. It's never led to a life change. The parable of the soils in Matthew 13 is evidence of that, isn't it? Those who were in soil that was shallow, the seed took root, but it couldn't go deep, and it sprung up quickly, but when there was trials and tribulation, problems, obstacles, they faded away. Brothers and sisters, we need to hear this warning that we would continue to pursue Christ, that we would stay rooted in him, that we would not be, that in the temptation to walk away, we would not do it. We would cling to him because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a frightening expectation to walk away from Christ. But secondly, as Alistair Begg says, remember, remember, there is a steadying enlightenment. Look at verse 32. Recall the former days. Recall, remember, remember back to something. We all have sweet memories, good memories of all kinds of things. Here, the author is instructing his readers to remember the days when they first were enlightened with the gospel. When the realization of who Jesus is and what he had done for them became true to them. When the light shined in darkness. When they were transferred from the spirit of darkness to the, uh, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. When they were born again, when hope sprung up in them for that first time. Recall after you were enlightened, how what? You endured a hard struggle with sufferings. What the author is saying is that for his audience, Falling away from the living God does not make any sense when you compare their amazing change that they went through when they learned about Christ. He's reminding them of what they experienced. Not only did they have knowledge, but there was a change in their life. Notice that when things got difficult, when they faced opposition... It says that they were publicly exposed to reproach. They were mocked publicly. They were ridiculed. They were afflicted. Sometimes they were partners with those who were treated. So it wasn't them who was being mistreated, but their covenant partners. Their brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 34 tells us that you had compassion on those in prison. It wasn't just that they had compassion on anybody who was in prison, but it was specifically those who were imprisoned for their faith in Jesus. You see, they didn't hide the fact that they were followers of Jesus. They actually boldly and in a very public way identified themselves with those who were being ridiculed, those who were being imprisoned, those who were being persecuted. 
They didn't hold back, but rather they remained steadfast. When the audience first believed, they faced suffering, persecution, opposition, but they faced it all with endurance, composure, compassion, and even joy. He reminds them that they endured sufferings. This morning when I got here, Andrew asked me if there was going to be a sports illustration. I was really proud of myself because last time I preached, I didn't use a sports analogy, which was fantastic. It's very rare for me. But this week it fits, and I can use one. Because this term, to endure suffering, is actually used in the first century of athletic contests to endure struggles, to endure sufferings, particularly in wrestling. It's this idea of striving until the end of the match to come out on top. Those of you who are football fans, you can think of squeaky bum time. Some of you don't know what that is. Squeaky bum time is the last 10 minutes or so of a football match. When both teams are struggling against one another, trying to find the winning goal, and everyone gets a little nervous, and mm, are we going to win? I don't know. Endure the suffering. See it to the finish line. Make it to the end. Endure. You see, these Christians that the author of Hebrews is writing to, they're willing to live as exiles on earth because they are convinced of something better than any earthly possession. I think the most astounding passage in all of the New Testament related to believers is found here in verse 34. We're told they had compassion on those who were in prison, but then we're told that they joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. Since they knew that they had a better possession and an abiding one. The author does not remind them that after their property was plundered, that they looked back on it and said, okay, we count that as joy. No, no, he says that as your property was being plundered, as it was happening, you were joyful. That's astounding to me. I come to this passage and it breaks me. Because I don't know how I would respond if I was facing persecution and beatings and if my property was being confiscated because I was a Christian, would I be able to look at that and say, yeah, take it. I mean, like Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, right? If someone asks for your tunic, give them your cloak also. Or did I get that backwards? You want my coat? Yeah, take my sweater too. Someone comes into my house and says, I want your dining room set. Hey, oh, take, take my living room set too. You want my bed? Take my closets as well. Have it all. I'm afraid that for many of us in a country like Malaysia, where we experience certain levels of prosperity, we don't own things, but things own us. And if anything was under threat because of our faith in the living God, I wonder how we would respond. Would we joyfully endure the plundering of our property? Or would we fight for our rights? I come to this and I'm, I'm broken. How do you get there? How do you become the kind of person who joyfully accepts the plundering of your property? Well, he gives us the answer. The reason that they could do that was because they were convinced that they had a better possession. That they had a better possession of anything that they had on earth. A better possession than anything in their household. A better possession than any piece of jewelry. A better possession than any car, BMW, Mercedes, MyV. You know, it's 
everything pales in comparison to the eternal abiding possession provided to us in Christ. So the author urges in verse 35, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. You see, they exhibited this confidence because they knew what was to come. They looked to their heavenly inheritance. They knew that the new creation was coming. The heavenly city that the author is going to talk about in the next few chapters in chapter 11, verse 10, verses 13 and 16, chapter 12, verse 22, and chapter 13, verse 14, he reminds them of the heavenly city that's to come and how it is better and how it is a permanent possession. How do we avoid this frightening expectation? How do we remain steady in our faith in Christ? We look to this better possession. We look to the better possession that we have been given in Christ. It is better than the earthly one. And looking to this better possession, they are able to endure all sufferings. they are reminded not to put too much hope in the city of man, but to put their hope in the city of God. And as they do this, there is a rewarding confidence that comes from it. As Alistair Begg said, keep on, right? Watch out, remember, keep on. Their confidence, as we just read, has a great reward. The reward comes experientially, we see with our eyes, today we have by faith, but in the future we will have by sight, a reward comes after completing all of God's will. All of God's will. Do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. You have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Their life, their confidence in Christ is lived out by a faith that pleases God. This confidence has a great reward. It pleases God. And their confidence leads to a endurance. Endurance in the Christian faith manifests itself as we faithfully do the will of God. Every believer is called to carry out the will of God entirely for their lives. When you are called to Christ, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer would say, he bids you to die to yourself and follow him. You see, following Jesus is not restricted to spasmodic periods, just little snippets of time where you might be hyped to live for Jesus, where you might be energized for God's sake. No, it's looking at the entirety, a consistency. As one rap group years ago, I said I wasn't going to quote, I told somebody I wouldn't quote these rap theologians, but I, one rap theologian, Flavor Flav says, don't believe the hype. Got to get it in there. Put it on my bingo card. Hype is a fleeting thing. Hype is fleeting. Hype comes and goes. We get excited about something and then it's not exciting. I'm afraid that many people are lured into a false type of Christianity where they are taught that Christianity is about hype and excitement and emotion and yay, let's go Jesus. And then when difficult times come, they have nothing to cling to because that excitement is disappearing. You see, what you win somebody with is what you have to keep somebody with. If somebody is won to Jesus because of an emotional excitement, then you have to figure out a way to keep that emotional excitement going. But if you win somebody to Jesus with the promises of his blood shed for them, for the forgiveness of their sins, for the 
empty tomb that stands proving that he's resurrected from the dead and that he's now seated at the right hand of the Father. There is a sure and steady foundation to endure in the faith. Being confident that there is a better possession made available to us. Brothers and sisters, do not succumb to cheap tricks of people masquerading in a Christian faith. Seeking false ways to prop up a fraudulent faith, but seek the abiding rock of Jesus, his blood shed for us. Now, how do you know if you're enduring? How do you know? The author says, you have need of endurance, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. How do you know if you're enduring? Well, three simple tests this morning. It's not an exhaustive test, but just three things to consider. Number one, how's your faith? And not necessarily like, what is it you believe, but what is it producing in you? Is there evidence of faithfulness in your life to Jesus? You see, True, genuine faith in Jesus leads to a life of faithfulness to Jesus. Christ is faithful to us as he's faithful to us. He produces faithfulness in us. How's your faith? Two, how's your joy? How's your joy? Are you joyful? Are you a curmudgeon? Are you joyful in Jesus? Do you look forward to being with Jesus' people? Or do you come bitterly? Do you come because somebody's dragging you? I have to be there. I don't want to be there, but I have to be there. How's your joy? Do you joyfully identify as a follower of Jesus in public? Number one, how's your faith? Number two, how's your joy? Number three, how's your obedience? As I mentioned before, being a Christian is not just a one-time decision, but evidence of consistently living in obedience to the Savior is evidence of a genuine Christian. How's your obedience? The Great Commission tells us to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that he commands. How's your obedience? You know, the first command in the Great Commission in making disciples, the first way to do that is to be baptized. Some of you in this room need to be baptized. And I've got great news. In the month of January, We have two people who are already lined up for baptism. And so if you're someone in this room who says, I need to be baptized in obedience to Christ, well, we can make that happen. Talk to me or talk to one of the elders after church so that we can arrange that. So that you can walk in obedience to Christ. So that you can show evidence of consistently living in obedience to Jesus. All of these things are written, not as scare tactics. The author here is not trying to scare his audience because notice how he finishes this chapter. He says, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. He's telling them the warnings that are real, that are genuine that are dangers that they need to be aware of, that they need to look out for. He reminds them of what is true about who he knows them to be based on their life of obedience in the past. And he's encouraging them to continue to keep on in this rewarding confidence, trusting that Christ has provided for them.
I started out talking about our wedding anniversary. In marriage, there are things that a couple must pay attention to. One of the things that couples do is celebrate their anniversaries. They remember that decision that they made many years ago when they signed that certificate. They don't remember the certificate, but they remember the promise that they made to one another. They spend time in conversations and they remember different times in their marriage where there was difficulties that bonded them together even more. They remember times of joy and they celebrate those. Those types of discussions and remembrances and celebrations, they just bond the couple even more. And so that they re- continue to remain faithful to one another and continue to grow in their marriage. One evangelist has said that a wife who is 85% faithful to her husband is not faithful at all. The same could be said about a husband. A husband who is 85% faithful to his wife is not faithful at all. There is no such thing as a part-time marriage, and there's no such thing as part-time loyalty to Jesus. If faithfulness is true for marriage in an earthly institution that's meant to convey the love of Christ for his church, how much more should Christ's people watch out for this frightening expectation? How much more should they remember when they became enlightened about who Jesus was? How much more should they continue on Keep on keeping on, holding on to that rewarding confidence that will lead them to great eternal rewards promised to those who belong in Christ Jesus. This morning, if you're a Christian, I hope you celebrate. We're going to continue our worship service. We're going to sing a song of response, and then we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And part of our worship is, is we fellowship in the word. And after we take the Lord's Supper together, we discuss what we've heard. And there are three wonderful discussion questions for you this morning to sit around in little groups and talk about what you've heard and process what God's word is saying and what the spirit is saying to you. Don't leave after the Lord's Supper and think that the worship is done because our small group fellowship in the word is part of worship. This morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, rejoice with one another. Remember, call each one to remember and to stay focused, to endure as we fellowship around the word. This morning, if you're with us and you're not a Christian, you're not someone who's ever placed their faith and trust in Jesus, and you want to know more about what that means, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to to place my trust in Jesus. Would you come talk to me after the service? I'll be standing up here. I'd love to help you understand. Maybe during the the fellowship and the word time, you you can't wait till the end of the service. And you say, I want to talk to you, Chris. Just grab me. I'll be up here. And we can go somewhere quiet and talk. Or maybe you can find Man Hunt or one of the elders. You can talk to Massimo or somebody you know and trust. We'd love to talk to you about that. Maybe it's the baptism issue and you need to be obedient in baptism. Come talk to us. But as we come to a close in 2023, let's end well. Let's set ourselves up for 2024 as we expect God to do great things. Let's pray. Father, thank you for reminding us of the blood of Christ that has paid the penalty of our sins, that assures our forgiveness that gives us the opportunity to be in your presence because we're cleansed. We pray that as we remember the work you've done in our lives and how you have emboldened us in our faith, that we would reflect on that, remember it, and use that as part of the fuel to continue to to live in obedience to you. And we pray that our lives of obedience would be inspiration to others who maybe are struggling, that maybe we could come alongside them and encourage them and lift them up. Father, we give you our lives this morning. We ask you to have your way with us 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.